Um, so I'll talk with you a little bit about the research in that center, and then as we wrap up, we can have some broader discussion about Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative, um, I hope. So the goal of this uh, institute or grouping that we have called CERC, Solar Energy Research Center, is to develop some of the underlying science that would be needed to take CO2 and water and use the uh, energy of a photon to take those molecules uphill to a fuel, and to do that using uh, artificial materials, not using living uh, objects. And um, so it's a center that has lots of pieces to it, and there's uh, some 25 postdocs and 20 graduate students here at the lab working on this project now. So it's a, you know, it's a substantial activity. How we squeeze that many people into five million of funding is a topic of continuous wonderment to the DOE, but we are able to do that because we're, um, you know, we're putting uh, as little money as possible into the salaries of um, <laughs> of, of staff scientists and uh, you know fat cats like me or whatever. So. Um, the goal of the project is to create fuels from sunlight with greater than 1% energy efficiency and abundant low cost materials and scalable processes with a 10 year target for demonstration. So that's the goal of the project and I showed this already uh, on Monday so and many of you will be familiar with it but just to briefly remind you of some of the rationale behind this, let's hypothesize that we took 60 million acres, that's a quarter of agricultural land and dedicated it to energy um, then if we were doing that at 1% power efficiency from photon to fuel, uh, that would be um, able to provide us um, the power generation that comes from, uh, that we get from gasoline presently. And if we could bring that up to 6 or 7%, we could replace our power use uh, more broadly. And 60 million acres seems like a lot of acres to devote to energy, even um, in a country as large as ours. So it's a little bit hard to imagine a scenario where you're going to devote a lot more land to energy. In fact, devoting that much already has huge environmental concerns and other impacts that you have to be worried about. And 1% is about three times the efficiency of the fastest growing plant, which is around a third of a percent. So if we think about the, you know, the, so the biofuels may very well uh, improve in efficiency. Certainly from what you heard from Jay's talk, they're going to improve in the ability to deliver a biofuel that's more usable uh, in a whole variety of ways. But um, there's still, um, you know, we'd like to get up to six or seven percent. Now it, it does turn out, um, well, we'll come to it in a moment. You'll see that um, basically, I'll just say right now what the big issue here is. If, if the ability to make it at large scale and cost is no object. <laughs> in other words, if you're allowed just to do a laboratory demonstration experiment, okay, if you're allowed to do just a laboratory demonstration experiment, then you can meet all of the criteria here readily. You can make an artificial photosynthetic system that operates way above all of these efficiencies. Okay? So you see the conundrum. If we have a, a, a natural system, a biofuel, uh, it can scale re readily to many times larger than the 60 million acres, no problem, but the power efficiency isn't quite high enough. If we take an artificial system, the power efficiency can be very high, but we can't make enough of it. And, and that's where the conundrum remains in this area. Um, and of course, the other requirement is that you make a uh, sufficiently e energy dense fuel, and we've seen some of these numbers already, but uh, you gotta have energy densities up in this range, and of course, Batteries are, are, are too low, uh, and so that's one of the other problems. Um, I'll also put this in the context of the PV that um, uh, Ramesh talked about earlier, and just kind of um, describe this in terms of a thermodynamic ladder. And so we have all these um, uh, photons raining down on us from the sun. They have about uh, two or two and a half EV uh, of energy per quantum particle coming all the time streaming at us. Um, many thousand times more energy than we actually need for all of our energy needs. So there's plenty of energy coming at us and our problem is we don't really know how to harness that terribly well still even to this date. Uh, but of course the easiest thing to do is to just focus the sunlight down onto some um, very small objects, make them really, really hot, 
uh, boil water and run a turbine and make electricity. <laughs> and that actually works, not so badly. Uh, so solar thermal is a very viable technology from a technology point of view. Um, and right now we know that there's a lot of um, uh, interest in building in California, a lot more capacity for solar thermal, bright source energy, which is right in Oakland and which has strong ties historically to our laboratory, uh, is, uh, has contracts for building a number of solar thermal plants in the desert. Interestingly, they've run, into, they've run afoul of um, a number of environmental groups who have been blocking them from building these uh, uh, desert installations. So it's clear that that dimension of the problem needs to be looked at. But in any case, uh, it's possible to just thermalize the photons. So you start off with these uh, photons that have, say, two and a half electron volts, and you just run them into heat. And then you use that heat to boil stuff, and you run turbines, and that works. Uh, the next higher level thing, of course, is to use the photoelectric effect and the fact that the, when the photon has uh, that much energy, uh, you can use the energy of the photon to uh, create band gap excitation in the semiconductor. The optimum for a single band gap semiconductor um, is around one electron volt, a little bit bigger than one electron volt for the band gap. If the band gap of the semiconductor um, uh, is uh, uh, larger, then every photon that does get absorbed, you get more energy from it because the energy thermalizes down to the gap. But of course, um, the, the problem is if the gap gets very big, then you miss all the red photons. So there's kind of an optimum band gap and it works out about 1.1 or 1.2 EVs. So that's kind of a, a next way of doing it. And in between, of course, uh, is to make a multi-gap cell instead of just having one band gap, but to have a band gap, one for the red, one for the green, and one for the blue to separately collect those photons. And those kinds of solar cells are what Ramesh talked about, which have efficiencies over 40%. So they're very impressive. You just can't make them on any large scale. Uh, solar fuel, on the other hand, uh, has, to my mind, scientifically at least, a more ambitious goal because it involves not just harvesting the energy efficiently, but also going entropically uphill uh, to take the fuel molecule, the, the constituent molecules of CO2 and water and recombine them into a fuel. You actually are increasing the entropy. Uh, substantially. So that's something that we don't actually really do act currently with our technology using the sun. So it's a, it's a great uh, challenge to do that. There's a long history. This is a problem that was worked on very, very deeply in the 1970s um, and uh, throughout since then, uh, but with, I would say, very little success. Uh, the earliest experiments uh, coming from Japan used some TiO2 or strontium titanate nanoparticles which have some platinum on them, they absorb UV light, and then upon absorption of the UV photon, uh, they can drive uh, water splitting to make uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Then you're left with the problem of storing the hydrogen. But if you could do water splitting with visible photons uh, at good power efficiency, that would be a major breakthrough. So this work um, has been out there for many years now, and the problem with it is that the band gap of the TiO2 is too big, so you're only using really very, very blue or really UV photons. And of course, uh, the energy actually needed to drive that reaction is a lot less than that. So basically, you're building up a giant overpotential by using very big photons. So that doesn't quite uh, do it. There have been a lot of efforts in between to find other materials, but none have really been successful. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, efforts to make compartmentalization because you know that if you make the hydrogen and oxygen, you can do it on a laboratory scale and just generate them and allow the gases to come out and it's okay. But if you started to uh, do this on a very large scale, you can't really mix the hydrogen and oxygen uh, at that large scale without running into other risks. So uh, the issue of creating compartmentalization is very important. I mentioned to you at the beginning, and here's one of the references um, uh, in which it has been shown years ago uh, that you could take some uh, semiconductor materials and platinum and uh, create an electro a photo electrochemical system which will uh, split water at 12.4% power efficiency. So that's way higher than the efficiencies I was mentioning to you. And in fact, the numbers since then have grown and it's maybe 15% or something like that. So the problem with this is these materials are formed by molecular beam epitaxy, which is a technique that's just very, very complex and doesn't scale at all. 
So although there's some existence proof that you can do this, it's really never really never been done completely uh, effectively. Now, after this long hiatus of rather little work going on in this field for um, since say 1980 uh, till 2008, uh, suddenly uh, we see uh, all the um, new centers popping up all around the world uh, uh, which are out there trying to set up new solar fuel activities. And in fact, the Department of Energy has now announced a solar fuel hub. So this has suddenly gone from a topic that was uh, kind of um, neglected for 20 something years to one that's actually being looked at very, very carefully. So our project is designed or intended to try to do this by uh, mimicking some of the features of biological systems, but not use any biological components. And so let me just give some feelings. We're, our our uh, goal is to make a nanoscale, uh, a system using nanoscale components. So let me go through some arguments here that would tell you why that might be needed. Um, this shows, of course, the uh, natural photosynthetic membrane. And shown here in cartoon form are all of the uh, uh, biological uh, subcomponents, uh, which consist of these multi-protein units in very complex arrangements and arrays and membranes that uh, do everything in this vectorial and highly organized way. And we're trying now to uh, copy some features of that, but only those features which would be absolutely essential and not uh, extra ones which might be there for other reasons. Uh, so here's a, here's a couple of quick, quick arguments about why it could be that we could end up with a membrane that has inorganic nanoparticles embedded inside it as the fundamental component for doing this. Um, so. Um, Here's two quick arguments. Um, so um, the first thing to remember is that when a photon gets absorbed in a semiconductor, uh, you take a bound electron and put it into the conduction band, leaving a hole behind. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that in most semiconductors, those electrons and holes are pretty delocalized. They actually might extend over uh, quite a large distance. But when they go to do the uh, actual uh, chemical transformation, the actual chemical reaction that will make hydrogen or oxygen or, or start to reduce CO2, those reactions will take place at a single molecular site. So if you have a very delocalized uh, semiconductor and the electron, for example, is photogenerated, uh, extends over a thousand or a hundred uh, uh, sites, then the reaction takes place only on one you have to have some process to relocalize the electron and have the chemistry take place on that very localized uh, site. Uh, in addition, you really need to have um, um, uh, these uh, uh, reactants generated um, very, very locally. So that these are arguments for why you want to have small components. On the other hand, um, there's another argument which says uh, you can't make the components too, too small. You could, you could take this argument and say, okay, let's make the uh, components smaller and smaller and smaller down to the size of a single bond. And that would just, from the argument I just gave you a moment ago, that would be okay. But uh, the, the problem is that ultimately, and you can kind of see it in the natural system, there has to be some vectorial uh, transfer of the energy inside the system. And in order to achieve that, one of our colleagues as part of this project, Gavin Crooks, has uh, written some really interesting papers, which I'm not gonna be able to go into the details of, but I'll just refer to them here, which argue that in order to get the directionality of the um, electrons and holes inside the system that we wanna operate with, uh, we have to pay a price uh, in energy in order to do that. There's a kind of entropic price to get that vectorial uh, direction, and that works out to being about 10 kT. And if you think about that, that means the, the first light absorbing unit has to dissipate some energy. And um, if the, the argument that we would make is if that turned out to be just the size of a single uh, molecule that's only you know, 10 atoms or so in size, and we're constantly dissipating 10 kT inside of it, we're gonna have a problem having it be stable. So this says you don't want the system to be too big because then you just have to relocalize the excitations to do the chemistry, but you don't want it to be too small because the uh, amount of uh, thermal energy that has to get dissipated is enough that you want to sort of average that out over the size of the system. And so that means you need a system that's about the size of these proteins, actually. And it works out to, say, five or so nanometers, and there you go. Um, there's another problem that uh, we've been thinking through and as part of our team, which has to do with the fact that the solar flux 
corresponds to roughly 1,500 solar photons per nanometer squared per second. These are uncommon units. Don't, people don't usually go about trying to figure out how many photons there are per nanometer squared per second. But for us, it turns out to be quite important because um, that means that the chemistry of the uh, pho photosynthesis has to keep up with the flux of the photons. And that turns out to be a very high uh, rate for the chemical uh, reactions to keep up with it for the catalysts, and also very hard to continuously be replenishing the molecules so that there are that many molecules present in each nanometer squared, 1,500 of them per second. That means that you have to have a whole system for transporting the molecules to the active sites, and the active sites have to be able to turn over very fast. In fact, the natural photosynthetic system does not keep up with this flux rate. Uh, natural photosynthesis um, will, um, uh, the, the, the efficiency of making uh, fuel using the natural photosynthetic system uh, keeps up with the sunlight up to about 15% of the full solar flux. And then beyond that, it actually saturates and in fact starts to spend energy finding new ways to uh, avoid having too much solar photons destroy the, um, the natural system. Um, but in our case, that's not allowed. We want to use all 100% of the photons that are coming in. So we know that we have a huge problem here to keep up with the flux, and that means that we need to have a, a pretty high turnover rate for the catalyst, higher than the turnover rate of the natural catalyst, actually. So we've got a big problem there. Um, so our team, uh, working together over some period of time, has developed three cartoon-like um, uh, prototypes of what different um, versions of this might look like. One of them consists of a segmented nanorod that has two different parts to it that absorbs light and sends electrons and holes in different directions, and they're embedded inside a membrane, and the membrane then, and then on one side you've got a reduction and the other side an oxidation catalyst. And I'll come back in a moment to the fact that we'll also need to look at um, what exactly this membrane's made out of, because it also needs to be able to transport some molecules through it. Um, another scenario looks like uh, this one, where we've got uh, kind of a core shell. Instead of a uh, half and half rod, we've got a core shell-like rod, um, which has uh, different components to it and the catalysts on the two ends. And then a third design, which has a silica wall, and then spanning the silica wall is a kind of molecular wire, and the molecular wire has the reduction and oxidation catalysts on the two sides of it. These are inside a tube, a silica tube, a wall of some kind. So there are kind of three designs that we've made here. They span, essentially, the scope of topologies and connectivities that you could make in such a design. Uh, so they're a plausible set. And basically, everyone in the project is trying to make one or the other of these in one way or another. None of them have been fully made, but big pieces of them have been made. So I'll just very quickly give you some examples of that. But before I do that, I just want to take a moment here and uh, mention to you this uh, recent paper from our erstwhile colleague and now lost at the Cornell, uh, Paul McEwen, uh, who published a really interesting paper recently. I just thought I'd take a moment and because it, it bears actually on the dimensionality of the problem too. Um, there's been interest in the solar cell and in the solar fuel community for several years now in this idea of so-called multi-exciton generation. So let me just say for a moment what that has to do with. I told you at the beginning that you can absorb the photons and you pick an optimum band gap. It's around one electron volt. And if you want to get more fancy, you just have three band gaps. Uh, there is an alternative, which has uh, been discussed for decades, really, which is uh, to design a material such that if the photon is above two band gaps, then instead of making one electron hole pair, you would make two electron hole pairs. And if it's above three band gaps, somehow magically this material would absorb the photon and make three electron hole pairs and so on. And this has been discussed uh, extensively in the literature and the only downside uh, with respect to it is that it doesn't really happen with any significant efficiency in most materials. It might happen, uh, you know, uh, with 10 to the minus 3 probability, occasionally, you know, a photon gets absorbed and you get two electron hole pairs or three, but it's not a very common process. And in fact, in the last decade, the literature has just been uh, positively populated with hypotheses that this might occur uh, with evidence that has been um, 
not even dubious, uh, really very poor evidence. And so it's kind of given that whole area a bit of a bad name. But then, you know, Paul has stepped in and written a really interesting paper. It shows a PN junction so, uh, uh, of a nanotube. PN because of how these gates, there are two different gates which are used to adjust the potential across the nanotube so that it appears to be like this PN-like junction and photons are being absorbed. And he has shown fairly systematically uh, for the first time because he's measuring the current and it's not strictly an optical technique that as you shine light on the system and as you go past a certain threshold, suddenly you start to see steps uh, inside the current which are consistent with generating more than one electron hole pair uh, per particle. It's an extremely interesting observation and all the um, uh, evidence is that it could have to do actually with the dimensionality of the system and with the phenomena which occur when electrons are accelerated in this one dimensional system over a very short region with a very large potential, that that process of the acceleration actually is intimately involved in the process of generating two electron or three electron hole pairs. And so coming back to some of these designs, they in fact involve some one dimensional structures uh, which also have the process that they might show processes of acceleration of the electron and hole across a very short distance. And so it could be that this is a, you know, this is something that the community should really engage in, uh, I think, more, and it's a very interesting topic. So just quickly, uh, some examples. Here, I'll show you quickly one that uh, I'm personally involved in, but that many colleagues are. Uh, to make one of these membranes, it consists of a seed of cadmium selenide embedded inside a cadmium sulfide rod with a platinum on the distant end. That's the electron reduction, that's the reduction catalyst. We're trying to put the oxidation catalyst here on this side now, so that's why I say this one's only partly made, but just to give you a quick feel for it, uh, it looks something like this. We have here um, in this seeded rod uh, system, a system which will um, um, uh, allow holes to be confined. If a photon gets absorbed, the hole will be confined inside a little seed, but the electron will only be very weakly confined, and depending on the exact size of the seed, the electron probably can sort of roam around inside this structure, whereas the hole will kind of stay localized inside the seed. And then we've got the reduction catalyst on this side, so an electron can head over to that end. Um, this is what these structures kind of look like with the little platinum tips on the end. And this just shows the uh, relative uh, uh, efficiency for hydrogen production uh, for different structures that we can make. So for example, if we have here our, our champion one, which has about a 20% quantum efficiency, so that's from photon to making hydrogen, we've got a little seed here for trapping the hole. Electrons and holes get absorbed around here, and the electron migrates over to this region and gets trapped, and then it does the chemistry on the platinum tip to make the hydrogen, and the hole stays behind over here, and in our case is sacrificially uh, used to react with methanol. Um, now, what you can see here that's very interesting from our perspective is that if there's no trap for the hole, uh, then the yield for making hydrogen is very, very low. And that's because in the semiconductor material, you can make an electron in a hole. The electron will come here uh, to react potentially to make hydrogen, but so will the hole, and it will come and react, and then nothing really happens. It's only when you introduce this kind of nanostructured component that has the potential well for localizing the hydrogen, the hole distantly. Uh, and of course, you can see that there's a critical distance dependence to this. Uh, how critical, how far you can go, I don't know. But um, this has a lot of the features that look like what would happen inside, for example, a biological system, which builds in these same kind of potential wells as a function of the distance. So it's an interesting system, and uh, that's probably all I'll say about it in this talk. There's a lot more to say, but I'm going to skip it. Um, the other system consists of uh, the one that Peidong uh, Yang and his colleagues have been working on for some time now. You'll know that it's been possible for many years to make forests of silicon nanowires and other kinds of nanowires. Um, Peidong has developed the ability to make TiO2, titanium dioxide, on the outside. You'll remember titanium dioxide was the material that the Japanese group was using originally in 1972 to make a material which would absorb UV photons and then perform some of the chemistry on it, uh, the oxidation step on it directly. Uh, so in this case, you're counting on the silicon to do the light absorption and then um, uh, arranging on it uh, this uh, growth by atomic layer deposition of a TiO2 film on the surface of that. It does show some good photoactivity, and indeed the electrons in the holes separate in the way that is planned, and Peidong's been publishing some nice work on that. 
Um, in fact, here you can see some very pretty silicon PN junctions that are radial, uh, so it's a related type of structure, and you can see that they're getting better at making those kinds of structures as well. Uh, so, and, and you know, it's not just the silicon, there's some other uh, indium gallium nitride nanowires. Uh, I see Joel Egger here in the audience, he's been thinking about things like that. Uh, there's some ideas uh, borrowed from some of Ramesh's uh, talks, wanting to use uh, dirt and things like that, uh, iron oxide. So, you know, there's a variety of different materials of this type that could go into this core shell kind of geometry of the nanowires instead of a segmented one or one where you have two zones like what I showed you. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the hot electrons, but uh, this is where, this is as far as, uh, Peidong, as far as I know, has gotten. So they've got this uh, TiO2 coated, and then there's the silicon, and he's got the platinum. The electrons, you'll remember, stay in the silicon. They're little platinum particles on the silicon, and he's deposited uh, uh, the TiO2 over here. So this now has, again, the vectorial kind of character to it, and as far as I know, they're testing it out at this point for making some water splitting and some things of that type. Um, and that's all I'll say about it. The third one, as I mentioned, is led by Heinz Frey, who has this idea of making these silica tubes, and the silica tubes will contain these kind of wires, and the, uh, they'll be now topologically, instead of having a top and a bottom, there's kind of an inside and an outside for each one of those tubes. Uh, the inside will uh, be where the reduction, say, takes place, and the outside where the oxidation does. So it's got a slightly different topology, if you like. And um, Heinz has these kind of molecular species, which are largely borrowed from uh, uh, organometallic chemistry, but also looking to some degree at some of the natural enzymes, although they, those don't contain these particular elements. He is looking carefully at some of the natural enzymes, which have small iron sulfur compounds and others like those in them, uh, which could do some of these things. So this is kind of topologically, again, what this thing would look like. Uh, that, that he has proposed and that he's building at this moment. And as far as I know, it's going quite well. Um, cobalt oxide is often thought as being an appropriate catalyst for making the oxygen. There's been a long literature on this and um, with a whole variety of different uh, reports in it. And recently, uh, Heinz and his colleagues have shown a cobalt oxide cluster, uh, which has a very high efficiency actually for producing oxygen and a very high turnover rate. I'm trying to see where I can see that here. But these are the cobalt oxides embedded inside silica. And uh, uh, here it is. Uh, he gets these turnover uh, frequencies of uh, 1,000 per second. And if you remember from an earlier view graph, I was saying about a few hundred per second is what you actually really need uh, to keep up with the solar flux. And these are pretty small systems. They're a few nanometers in size. So it looks like some of these cobalt oxides could turn out to be very good catalysts that are commensurate with all of our needs for this project, and that's being looked at very carefully now. Looks like a really interesting set of experiments, and we'll see how those go. So also with manganese doing similar kinds of things. So, so those are basically the three main types of uh, geometries that are being looked at, and that's all I will probably say about those as well. Now, a little bit about the membranes. As I mentioned to you, it's one thing to, kind of where our project has been, has been saying, okay, let's make these units which absorb photons direct electrons and holes, and have catalysts connected on the end of them. But we know ultimately that those have to be embedded inside a membrane. And in fact, the membrane needs to do a lot of different things. So here are examples, for instance, of some of the nanorods that we make embedded and created into membranes. Uh, so that's a start, it looks like. I mean, and these membranes can be quite big in terms of area. But um, then you have to look carefully again at one of these kinds of uh, back of the envelope type calculations. And one of the things that you realize is, of course, that uh, you need to have the um, uh, protons be able to travel back uh, from the uh, oxygen generating side over here uh, to the other side where they'll be reduced. And so these nanorods can't just be embedded inside a, any old plastic. It has to be a plastic that can also transport the protons at a goodly clip. And uh, Rachel Siegelman and her colleague uh, have been looking for some time now at the rates at which we could expect the protons to move across these membranes. Uh, so that's an additional problem, and it turns out that, um, for example, the nafion or other proton conducting membranes look like they're nowhere near close enough in terms of being fast enough in their transportation of the protons to keep up with everything else. So we've found now that there's yet another problem that we have to solve there, and it's not quite solved. Um, one last thing I'll mention is that in the last several weeks or more, a couple of months, the team has been looking very hard at how to scale these things up to much larger sizes. 
And there have been a lot of discussions along those lines, most of which for a variety of reasons I have missed. So I can't really update you on them completely, but there's an effort underway to try to you know, imagine what it's gonna be like to build these things at sort of this length scale of sort of tens of centimeters. Uh, and it turns out that of course there's a huge scale between what I just showed you, which is only operating on the scale of one nanoscopic unit to making something on a very large scale like this. Uh, there's a huge amount of science that goes into that. A lot of that's gonna be in this hub proposal. You'll know that the hub proposal will be led by Caltech. We will be a large um, second piece of it along with colleagues from a number of other uh, universities that we're talking to. So that gives you at least a feeling for where the solar fuel hub stands at the moment. Basically, we're building these prototypes. Most of them are almost working and uh, we'll see you know, six months from now how good they are uh, and whether they uh, get us anywhere. So um, let me now uh, uh, come back a little bit to the um, to this Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative and make some general comments about it and also solicit some of your uh, feedbacks. Uh, you've had a chance now over the course of this week to see pieces of this entire uh, puzzle and to start to see for yourselves just how much work is going on at the laboratory, what a broad scope that it covers. And I hope that you can start to relate to my feeling as I was trying to learn about all of these things uh, that um, I was uh, learning more and more that people knew specific parts of it but weren't enough talking about the uh, bigger picture. And I, I still think that that's a big issue for us and that this issue of climate modeling and energy analysis in particular, if we're able to situate those right in the center, uh, they'll be able to help us coordinate all these activities uh, so that they come together in a good way. Uh, I think implicit in some of the discussions I was hearing today, for example, in energy storage and solar PV and artificial photosynthesis, we have really common needs there to understand the scarcity of some materials, how things can be made on very large scales and so on. And you've heard those kinds of discussions in the capture and sequestration piece and so on. So I think there's tremendous uh, synergies to be had there and, and I'm hoping that they will materialize. Now, uh, before we uh, wrap up to questions, um, I wanted to uh, come back to this uh, topic of uh, walk the talk, which I brought up briefly. Uh, when I sent out my request to the laboratory for um, what are your suggestions about uh, strategic initiatives for the laboratory, almost a third of them came back saying, we would like the lab to be a greener workplace and to show that it's a greener workplace uh, by its own actions and not in some hypothetical way. And I believe we should do that. Uh, this shows here our energy consumption uh, as a function of the month over the last uh, time period. And it turns out if you extend this over some distance, you'll find that there's a slow, slow decrease uh, that's going on for the laboratory, which is fine. And these are sort of various seasonal kind of events that are going on uh, where we consume different amounts of energy uh, as a function of the time uh, during the year. Um, so let's talk about all of these buildings. Um, these are buildings which are greater than 10,000 square feet and uh, which are um, uh, buildings which um, I believe could each uh, individually uh, adjust up or down their consumption of energy in different ways. Uh, in fact, the evidence for that is overwhelming as shown by this graph which shows uh, year on year compared to last year whether you uh, consumed less energy and are therefore green or more energy, and they're therefore red uh, compared to the year before. And you'll notice that some buildings are uh, doing very well and some buildings are not doing very well. And of course, there could be different factors that relate to this and, and they, they could relate to things like um, special phenomena going on in any given building. I don't dispute that. But nonetheless, this is a sort of overall observable fact that we can collect. These buildings have been selected out from the LBL buildings on the basis of the fact that they each have their individual power meter, uh, which is not the case for some of the other buildings where they only come in, 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 in groups. And therefore, um, I declare today the Director's Building Energy Savings Challenge. You are each challenged to adopt personal sustainable practices in energy consciousness. Uh, we have 25 on-site buildings of greater than 10,000 uh, square feet, which are each separately metered. And uh, the rewards, besides uh, psychic benefit, are um, that we will uh, 
buy you lunch or a barbecue <laughs> uh, if you are successful in being the building that, uh, that uh, does the most to make your building uh, the greenest on that plot uh, next year. Uh, the question arises, is this competition fair? There's a possibility that it's not. I, I don't know how to correct for all those possibilities, but I will consider those issues carefully as I go along and get more information. I wanted to put something out today. Uh, I don't really know how to correct, for example, if there's a renovation going on in part of a building and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, so I think we'll just ignore it. And in the end, we'll make, it'll be obvious that somebody did better than everybody else, I'm hoping. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention to you, we're trying to get our website Many of you will know that we've been posting all week the videos and the presentations. They're posted on the Carbon Cycle website. They're posted in such a way that the video and the view graphs are both present side by side in a way that makes them easy to access. And I'm hoping that we will build up this website to become much more than um, just the collection of those videos. But um, so, for example, uh, you'll see here this non-existent link at the moment called CC 2.0 Forum, uh, which will be there shortly, and which will be a place in which people can post their opinions or have a variety of discussions. Uh, we're asking that if you're interested in knowing more about the initiative as we go forward, that you feel free to post your email address there specifically so that we're not uh, blasting out to thousands of people who don't want to see about this, but that we localize the group of true believers, such as you, who have suffered through um, these multiple days of uh, all of these talks. Uh, we'd like to, to get you to be um, a part of that. And I can assure you that it will be a focus of mine to have this um, activity be uh, continuing and to be, uh, to be developing uh, fully. And I'll just uh, go back to this and uh, stop there and open for any questions or comments on the initiative. Yeah. So uh, I like your uh, building initiative on the measuring the electricity and power usage. And uh, perhaps someone at your level can help us have facilities send those out regularly. Because yeah. Oh, yeah. for no. about uh, three years now, yeah. uh, I know at the cyclotron, it's one of the things I always monitored. Uh, we don't get it except we can try to tease it out of the cost. And I've requested okay. this in the past. So Yeah, we get the numbers, of course, monthly. And we'll make sure they're out there monthly, yeah. Right. For all the buildings. I mean, I think right. you can just send it to all the buildings. Yeah, sure. I saw it from all the buildings. Uh, Cyrus uh, brought me from uh, Blair this big stack of, uh, so, you know, that's right. We need that. Yes? In the interest of helping you make that contest more nearly More fair. nearly fair. Uh -huh. yes. uh, you might want to post the uh, energy per square foot of each building and show that as well as the improvement. Because uh, the Chinese have a great expression for whipping the fast dog. Uh, the most efficient building uh, is uh, the one that gets pushed the hardest. And in fact, it's harder to, well, you understand. Yeah, sure. OK. So following up on that, and, and actually getting to an issue that I think we're going to run into is, you know, we talk about green, and you know the metric of green is really moving all over. And for example, even today we saw the issue of like carbon emissions, and you know, some energies will look bad if we only have a one-year carbon emission. Right? They'll look really bad initially, but over the long, the life of the technology, they will bring carbon down. So whether you measure carbon on a one-year horizon, but then even you know, even other things, you brought the literature. As green, uh, it's all over the, the map. We might have to think a little bit about how we're going to measure our performance, not just for buildings, but I mean in the broader sense of, of assessing different technologies. Sure. I mean, it's a it's a complicated topic. You know, uh, whether you do life cycle analysis and how you do it is is, is it. I agree. This uh, question of how do you improve our ability to work with people in different departments and different yes. specialties that we yes. may have very limited connection or may not yes. even know about. 
Yes. How do you plan to promote that? Yes. Well, I, I can tell you that is my biggest concern in this whole, that's what's prompting me to want to push this initiative forward, is that, in my opinion, we're not far enough along in that dimension at all. And that, that is, um, uh, we're, we're not realizing our full potential because of that uh, fact. Um, so what I can say is um, one step is to have events like what I'm just, what we're just hosted here where we're trying to do tutorials, information, and get those things out there. But we clearly need to create a more living form of that, a more continuous form of that. And, um, uh, you know, I've asked, the, there's a CC2 uh, steering committee, I've asked them to really think hard about this. Uh, just this morning I was meeting with our uh, leadership council at the lab, I've talked to the division directors about this. I'm very uh, interested in hearing feedbacks on suggestions that you have for ways to make it so that there's more frequent opportunities to uh, interact across the laboratory and to have more discussion and to build those links. You know, we, we suffer a little bit from the geography, the physical geography, and the fact that everybody, of course, as in any pretty successful institution, everybody feels pretty busy and forget to come up for air and think about, you know, the really big issues and how they can work with their colleagues next door as opposed to ones they're meeting when they're traveling away someplace far away. So uh, I'm concerned about it. I don't have an answer for you at this moment, but it's certainly something I want to try to work on hard. So I'm, I'm interested in getting your thoughts. Uh, I think there's a general consensus, and uh, President Obama emphasized uh, the importance of doing here in his uh, recent State of the Union address. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't seem to show up anywhere here, despite the history and unique capabilities of this laboratory in that realm. Yeah, uh, it hasn't shown up here so far. Um, um, it has to do with, uh, um, so there's a number of things that didn't make it onto this list so far, not just nuclear. And what I would say is uh, uh, I, there are certain criteria that have to be made before you can get onto this list, some of which have to do with the capability of being able to reach you know, gigatons and to be an extremely important initiative, and some of which have to do with whether we're able, whether we're succeeding at this moment in getting all the parts of the laboratory to come together into the parts of an initiative that are needed. So I believe in nuclear, we have great potential there here at the lab, but it hasn't quite come together in certain ways yet that I would like to see before I'll put it here as a circle, but there's room for a circle there, so. <laughs> <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> sorts of uh, indicators you, you might have in mind in terms of the success of this integrated, integrative uh, activity and you know what, what are the things that will make you feel like yes yes it's working yeah well of course uh, these are that's a hard question and it's uh, equally it, it's you know um, as, you, as we just had the brief discussion, the question of how am I going to really make it so people can work together better across the laboratory, that's a fuzzy thing. It's not something that's necessarily so terribly easy to measure. Uh, and um, so sometimes people are nervous about that, and they're saying, okay, um, you know, now my guess is, and I'm just going to guess, that we'll have no trouble quantifying some uh, increased dollar flow into the laboratory as a result of this initiative a few years from now. I'm not really too worried about that because I know that areas like climate modeling and energy analysis and some of these other areas are just, they're poised right now for new funding. And so, you know, the, the traditional measures of dollars and so on, uh, I don't think we're gonna struggle too much with, uh, but I'm struggling much more with uh, what I believe is the even more critical aspect of uh, developing the intellectual atmosphere inside the laboratory to where it's one that's uh, more collaborative. Uh, that's not something that's e as easy to put a number on, but I do believe that people recognize it when they see it. Um, and there are some organizations where, you know, you walk in the door and you can just feel it, that it's there. And so I'm assuming that we're gonna know, but I'm, I can't put a number on it hard. And, and, and frankly, that's more my objective than anything else because we could just let a lot of these things go in silos 
and the dollars would probably still grow uh, for a while at least. <laughs> uh, now, they may not in the long term because if, unless we produce actual uh, science that leads to real solutions, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that may collapse. And uh, so I think um, an ancillary rationale for us here is to also provide the uh, justification and framework so that people can understand the importance of this whole project and why it really matters. And, and so, you know, that's kind of an answer. Okay, well, thank you very much. And don't forget, contribute to the initiative now that you sat here and watched all this stuff. Okay.